I thought we'd continue our software craftsmanship um, topic. And in particular, I was inspired by a lot the last couple, about two months or so, about like a lot of people talking about like enjoying work and what, what helps them uh, developers and you know, enjoy their work more. So I thought I'd have put up some ideas that people had and um, uh, I thought I'd also like open this up to conversations to, to, to figure out you know, what, how can we benefit from it, from it and uh, what, what specific things do we enjoy. So um, specifically, let's start off. I, I wanted to ask, see, what do you enjoy about work when you enjoy work? Um, since we always don't always enjoy work. So uh, yeah, throw things out there. What do you, what do you enjoy? Well, I'll start. I enjoy challenging problems. Collaboration. Collaboration. Great. Does anybody else enjoy work from time to time? Whiteboarding, just, I mean, collaboration is kind of it. whiteboarding, just getting in front of a board and sort of talking to solutions, solutioning. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yes, absolutely. Sense of purpose. Good one. Say, like working at the edge of my knowledge. So mm. this week, something I did was um, I hadn't done it in a long time, but I debugged Django itself. Like I dropped into. So it was like I forgot how to do that because it had been a long time since I'd done something like that. So it was like remembering how to do that was good, and then. The other side of that is when you have some skills and you're building on something and then it's like, oh, I don't know how to do that. And you use those skills to kind of dive into that thing that you don't know yet. Yeah, yeah. That's another part of, like, I guess the other side of working at the edge of your knowledge is, like, using your current skills to build into something new. Yeah. So, like, I could maybe compress that a little bit to, like, learning, but also, like, yeah, being, like, right there on the edge of your yeah, capabilities. Yeah. yeah, it's like not writing a string parser for the third time or something, you know, like, Working on something new, essentially. Using your yeah. skills to, to work on something new. So kind of similar to challenging problems. Yeah. I also really like running the thing that I built. Hmm. Uh, like, and just being like, oh, there's that thing I built, and it's solving that problem. And then now I can put a bunch of work in, and now I'm just running. Yeah, running. Similar to that, um, but slightly different is type, like a quick iteration loop. Yes. So even if it's not the excitement of it being done, it's like just being able to work on the problem problem quickly and get feedback. Mm -hmm. So that whether that's with your code or with someone else, um, just being able to quickly know if you're right or wrong and then mm -hmm. try the next thing. Seeing progress, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Seeing progress, yeah. Yeah. And and knowing that something's wrong quicker. Yeah. 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 Uh, extending on the on the uh, playing at the edge is is that I like the idea of having a problem. I think, geez, how the hell do I solve this? Mm. And then start learning, applying things that I know, and realize oh, why do I want to solve this? I yeah. Realize. Yeah. So like realizing uh, you're capable of of solving something new or something like that. Yeah, using your current skills to break down a problem that you thought was. Or yes. <clears throat> Great. Good ones. Very good. What yeah. I, what I like is kind of looking at a problem and being able to simplify it, kind of come up with a, a simpler way of doing it. Yeah. Just kind of getting rid of stuff, saying, oh, this is nothing. nothing Maybe it's more elegant, but it just sort of solves the problem. 
Yeah. Absolutely. I just realized I'm not sure that it's this is recording everybody else's voice, so I'm just going to read these through for people watching later. So challenging problems, collaboration, um, doing solutioning and whiteboarding with, with teammates and coworkers, a sense of purpose, uh, learning and working right at the edge of your capabilities and like really just expanding that edge as you're going, uh, running the thing I built, quick iteration loops, Realizing you can solve unsolved, what you thought were unsolvable problems. Um, um, being able to simplify or get rid of stuff, optimizations. Anything else? Yeah. yeah I'd actually say expanding your domain knowledge. So Ooh. Apart from the programming tasks, there's yeah. learning about the domain. Learning about the domain, expanding domain knowledge, yeah. Absolutely. All right, great. Well, got space one more if anybody wants to, but otherwise I'd be happy to move on. <laughs> yeah? I just thought of one that's kind of similar to some others, but uh, speeding up your processes. Ooh. So one that I just found out about at work, we have a, um, we have a lot of data, and so to get, local, to get a good set of data locally, we have a thing to pull down a truncated database and then restoring it, to, it's like five minutes. And I combine those two in an alias, which is nice because then I can sit and wait. I don't have to like put in two commands. But then someone told me, oh, actually, if you just grab the data every once in a while and then do a restore, um, a like drop the database and restore from the, the other one, like a, a backup of it locally, it's way faster. And I was like, oh. And she had it as two separate commands. And then I was like, oh, I can actually make that into an alias. And now it's one command. It's way faster. And so I'm hoping to share that with the rest of the team after I test it a little more to make sure I didn't break it. <laughs> or like it actually does everything the right way. Nice. But I'm hoping that saves people time, because it is annoying when you have to kind of back to the quick iteration. Um, I was working on something where I really needed, I needed to change the data. And then I probably have to roll it back so that I make sure that I did it right and things like that to test. And so if any, I know other people have run into stuff like that. So if I can speed that process up for a lot of people, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, isn't that, that, I love that. It's, um, when, I think the, when I learned to code, I, I sped, up, sped up a process, and it, like, it was like cocaine. <laughs> like I, I took a, a process that took two weeks, and my script was able to do it in four hours. And I was just like, this is possible? This is amazing. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, thanks for all those. These are some great, yeah, I agree completely. I think these are a great list of things that we enjoy. Um, hello, <laughs> welcome. Um, I, it's funny, like I messed this up. I don't have my preview, my notes or anything, but, oh yeah, so this is what I wanted to do. It was like, okay, so here are all these things that we all like, right? How cool would it be to do more of this, right? Because I, I especially imagine like this isn't an even distribution. We don't all get to do these different things at work. So let, let's, how do we get to do that? To, uh, to talk about that, I wanted to talk about this developer, Alex Everloaf. So he did create a blog post where he talked about uh, his experiences at, at a company where um, he had worked for this company for a very long time and he transferred to a new team. And right from day one, he had a hard time with it. <clears throat> uh, he had more than 19 years of experience in a particular stack. And this team still used that stack, but he couldn't make sense of the code base. Even simple things would take him many days longer, days longer than he would expect to get things done. Um, and he just felt dumb and helpless. You know, here's someone who has more experience than I do, <laughs> feeling dumb and helpless you know, on this new team. And it wasn't just him. The whole team was struggling from technical debt. Um, and as he wrote, leadership did not care about code quality as long as the stories were delivered on time. Corners were cut and tests were skipped. And I totally, like, I don't know about you, but I've had 
jobs where this is the case, where leadership is like, we just need features delivered on time, no matter what, and, 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 and just keep you know, the drumbeat of progress going. You know? so, but, um, but I also feel like, what am I trying to say? What I wanted to say is like, leadership really shouldn't care about code quality because they're not in it. They don't, they can't measure it. They, well, you know, we, they can set up tools and stuff like that, but it's like, they don't have any direct input into it. It's our problem as developers. We are the ones responsible for it. If it comes to the point where the leadership is worried about code quality, then it's a real problem and they need, they need to step in and help us fix it. So in this case, uh, what they did was they, the team got together, it was all the developers, the project managers, the, the uh, other managers, people managers, like everybody came together and had an honest conversation that this was an untenable solution, something needed to change. Initially, the developers were like, we just need to stop working on anything new and just you know, clean up everything. And you know, the, they're like, well, how long is that gonna take? Well, we don't know, you know? And so like, the leadership was like, pushed back, like, no, 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 you can't do that. You know, we've, we have, we've promised new features to people. We have got bugs we need to fix. Like, there's all sorts of reasons, right? And I think rightly so. Like, as much as we developers would like to just stop and clean everything up, like, we would probably, it would take forever to do that. <laughs> so they went back and forth. They talked at some length to try to figure out what, what can we do? And they finally compromised on every other Friday they would spend reducing technical debt. Um, now, and uh, as Alex said, it was initially really hard to defend spending 10% of the team bandwidth on cleaning their code, but the payback was huge. Now, he, neither he nor anyone on his team like, did measure any metrics about before and after, so we don't know like, like, truly like, the difference. But the tangible, they, they, he, he was enabled to enumerate six specific ways that he noticed that, a change. First, the code quality improved. That's interesting. I just realized that this is ahead of this. Anyway, um, they were able to deliver features faster. Nearly all embarrassingly unnecessary incidents were eliminated. Uh, it enabled, enabled them to make better judgment calls when they had to cut corners. And additionally, having made those cuts, they were able to better um, catch them back up and like, smooth them back out afterwards. Uh, they enjoyed their daily work more, and they inspired other teams to do the same. So when I look at this list, I think it's, it's an impressive list, you know, like especially kind of retrospectively thinking, wow, this is the way it used to be. I, mean, I don't know how many months in the future he, he, he was talking about these things. But when I look at this and I think, you know, if, if somebody were to come to me and say, Chris, like, I, how about I wave a magic wand and I'll improve the quality of your, the code in your project. I'd be like, that sounds pretty cool, you know? Like, especially if it's like really optimized and like it's you know, really clean, maybe I'll be able to kind of borrow some of the patterns from it and like use it to kind of make new code, but I'm gonna mess that thing up, you know, eventually. Um, if somebody said, what if you could deliver features faster? Again, that sounds cool too to me, you know? I like delivering value to the place I'm working at. Um, sounds nice. Getting rid of you know embarrassing incidents, I'm all for that. Like, um, and then you know better judgment calls. Yeah, those sound good. But honestly, it's funny. Like when when I was first reading it, the first four kind of jumped out at me. Like, wow, these they, that's pretty cool that the whole team could notice this. But then the, the last two really started to jump out at me because I was thinking like, what if you're a member of another team in the department and you're hanging out at the kitchenette and you notice like there's you know, the, the team members from this one team just are kind of like, you know, probably like sarcastic with each other, just kind of a little blow. And then a couple of months later, they're just like, hey, you know, full of energy, just like, hey, you want to go out to lunch, you know, whatever. Like the fact that other teams notice a difference in that team and wanted to, to do the same, that sounds, that like, to have a transformative experience like that, I'd like that. And I'd like you to have that. I want to enjoy my job so much that others want to join in. And I want that for you too. So Chris, yeah. are you saying that 
Agile took the fun out of our jobs? <laughs> <laughs> I am definitely not saying that. Okay. Uh, I, I believe that. Oh, okay. I believe that. I think, I think that the fact that he was able to do that is magic. I have mm. friends that are project managers and they're constantly struggling with the fact that they have agreements with their business partner that the fourth sprint is going to be a technical debt sprint. Yeah. That lasted about one month. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And they're constantly every now every every sprint is a is a is a feature sprint and they're building up the technical debt and it's I think it's the false promise of Agile. I think that it's it's a it's a trap and I think that I understand the the benefits and why we ended up with Agile, but but uh, it's another monster that we have to kill. <laughs> you know? I especially think capital A Agile is a beast. The, you know, what gets sold to companies is like, follow this plan and we'll, and you'll, you'll provide better, you'll have a better product and stuff like that. Yeah. Lower case, lowercase a agile is developing with agility. It's the idea that the agile manifesto started with where working, where, what is it? I'm trying to remember the four of them. It's like, it's like, cause you, you look at the agile manifesto and they're like people and, and over yeah, people over process. Uh, 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 working software over documentation. I can't remember the other two, but like if you look at Capital A Agile, it's almost like they've reversed everything. They're like, look, here's this process. Let's follow the process and let's not care about the people. Uh, let's document everything. And yeah. So I, thank you for bringing that up because I feel like this is, this is kind of what I was, was thinking of. Is like when I was, especially when I was working on this, I feel like every team is different. And, and honestly, being on all, every, all these different teams, like I think I'm really curious to see what you think about some of the things we come to soon, because when I heard about people, I'll, I'll get to it. I'm, I'm really, but uh, but thank you for for, yeah. for sharing. And so yeah, one of the things that happened recently to me, uh, speaking of agile, is I feel like I feel like all the work needs to be in stories or it doesn't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's this, I had some like conversation with my director and he was like, oh, you should be spending an hour or two a day on code improvement. I'm like, that's not how this works. <laughs> like you have to, you have to put it in priority and it has to come from management. Like, and the team needs to pull together on these things or else they don't get done. Yeah, yeah. It's just not, you can't just assume that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really interesting thing because, like that. Uh, yes, <laughs> and this is where hello. Um, yeah, so so it's it's interesting to me because like my, the last job I was at, they they also agreed that like everything that needs to be done should be a ticket, but the way they got around it was like not every ticket had a value. Some or actually, actually every ticket had a value. One was zero. Meaning like, yeah, it should be done, but it's not going to count towards I don't know, our velocity. Yeah, yeah, which I thought was also interesting. Like, I, I feel like essentially what we're really seeing is like software development. It's not so much broken, but it's such a complicated thing. And that, um, you know, a lot of times, like especially with the capital A Agile, as I was saying, like we are given a, a, a process and they're saying like, follow this process. And we need to have the uh, ability to like say like, can we adjust this? Like, I, I, well, here's an issue. How can we bend things a little bit? How can we shape it some to kind of fit our team? Maybe. Autopilot. Autopilot. <laughs> <laughs> autopilot or copilot? Yeah, but I think it's kind of like, it's kind of an autopilot sort of thing. Like, you stop asking the questions about like. Oh, yes, yeah. Can I improve the code quality? You stop asking the question about like, can I improve Absolutely. Right. I mean, my, my argument is, is I think that what we lost with Agile is a lot of architecture work. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when people, like the guy, he said, I got, nothing made sense. There was no architecture to what he was trying to learn, you know? And, and I think that, that a lot of times our technical debt is decisions that were made on a sprint that mm -hmm. caused architecture problems, mm -hmm. you know? And if you don't have time to fix those architecture problems, you're just building up a bigger mess. It's also the time to have the conversation. Because I feel like 
we're in this rush uh, from day to day to have the meeting, to groom the stories, to, right. to like to have this meeting sure. that, to, yeah. that we don't just slow down and have the conversation about what it needs to be, who it fits for, and that sort of thing. Yeah. How it fits in with everything else. <laughs> Paul, would you? Think you're ultimately going to spend the time on the things that you're evaluated on, right? That's true. And so if you're evaluated on building features, you're going to build features. Yep. If you're not, and if you're not positively evaluated on increasing core quality, you're going to avoid that. Yeah. And so I, I think that there is something that needs to be, I mean, in, in larger organizations which have large performance evaluation things, they need to take a look at these uh, ways they're evaluating people and you know what they're. Um, prioritizing and not prioritizing and say, okay, well, you know, we we want this person to do X, but we're not we're not rewarding that in any way. Uh, or we're actually discouraging that in the way we evaluate them. So I mean there's there's that element to it as well. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, if you spend a lot of time, you know, if you spend fifty percent of your time improving the code quality and making it run faster and at the end of the year, you don't get recognized for that, then it's no benefit to you. So you're quickly going to not do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting, too, because one thing that you were talking about that, that struck a chord to me, I was listening to a podcast this week that said uh, teams that have well factored code, you know, refactored and clean code, are twice uh, as efficient as those who don't. And I was just like, like, yeah, it blew me away considering like 2x improvement, you know, like that's, that's significant. Mm -hmm. um, but number. yeah, it's a huge number. And, but we, the rest of us don't know about that. Like that's, I think, uh, I, I don't know when the survey was done, but they, you know, or the research I should say. Um, but I just heard about it this week and I was just like, this is going down in my coaching book. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, yeah, teams go up and down too. I mean, teams Absolutely. Change, um, so, and so bringing people in, it's just going to take time too, right? Yeah. So I think the more refactored your code is and the more, um, I guess, up to date your code is, uh, it can still work. I mean, like, like, I think on the last time I was on, I was looking at code that, you know, it was Java, but, and it still worked, but it was more Java 8 style than more, you know, Java 17 or 22 style. Oh. And so, you know, there's time, there's better ways of doing it. It still works, but, you know, it's, it's a little bit hard to read, harder to read and harder to get people to, you know, some people are coming out, you know, people, you know, that started 10 years ago would understand it, but people starting now, maybe not, you know, maybe that isn't the way they learn it. So, totally. Anyway. Yeah. Let me see if I can do this. Okay, so it is mirroring. That's the issue. I was just trying to figure out why. Okay, cool. So maybe now if I come over. All right, cool. So back to this. There we go. All right. Okay, well, thanks again for contributing to this. Um, as I was doing my research, or actually, I should, I should say, like, as I said earlier, for the last couple of months, I've kind of been inspired by people who've like looked into what makes developers happy. And what I was really shocked to find out was that there was a team of researchers that, that thought this a few months, a few years ago, excuse me, and um, looked at various companies who had um, teams that had developers who were very satisfied. And they researched them to see what commonalities are around them. And they published a book called Accelerate. Is anybody familiar with this book? You are? Yeah. I just read it like a few weeks ago. No kidding. Yeah. No kidding. How about that? <clears throat> I still haven't read it, but I have re I've read and saw a lot of videos of people who are quoting from it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I just found it was fascinating that, like, essentially, uh, there are 24 different things that they kind of came up with that, like, everybody has in common. And I thought I'd just grab 10 of them, that kind of, yep. Yeah. Not kidding, 12 copies of this book. No, no kidding. Yeah. How about that? Wow. 
I think it's a few years old, so I guess it's, it's just getting more popular as, as time goes on. Um, so yeah, that, like I think there are, I think, 24 properties that they kind of talked about. I thought I'd grab 10 that like kind of resonated with me, and I thought we'd kind of talk about them. So first one, automatic deploy process. Oh yeah, go ahead, sorry. If you're interested in reading that book, um, if there's a, an app you can get called Ho or Hoopla. Yeah. And if you, it works through your library, so if you have a library card or if you don't, go get one. Um, and at least through Henrico, and I think maybe through Richmond, but I was able to get it through there and nice. it on my iPad. Nice. So I'm sure, I think you can read it even on a computer. Yeah. You might have it. But anyway, that, that's how I read it for, for and free. And so. Libby, too, is another app that does the yeah, same thing. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't on Libby for me. But it was no on kidding. Hoopla. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So also, if you have used so these I, apps before, try both. Is Hoopla one that library can have indefinite number of copies of the book. I think so. Yeah, okay, yeah. Right. So it's more expensive for the library than Libby, but yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's still bad yeah. for you. Yeah. Word. Uh, so yeah, automatic deployment processes. Um, does anybody work at work? Does anybody have anything like this? Kind of? Yeah. La, la, kind of squishies. Um, yeah, I, I find this interesting because like, I, I, I've had one job where we've had a automatic deploy process, but it wasn't that complicated. But it did take six or seven minutes to get things deployed, but still it was automatic, so I was very thankful for that. Uh, but everywhere else seems to be some kind of mix of automatic and manual. Does that kind of jive? Yeah, well, I see a lot of nodding heads, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. it makes me think about, like, like it, I, and since you read the book, does it go into anything more detail about, like? A little bit. Uh, they talk a lot about CI, CD, and making, yeah. it's basically, um, making it so that it's a lot of best practices from DevOps. And so it's like making it so that whatever you build off of master has artifacts so that you can always deploy from that kind yeah. of thing. And it's like, so that it builds those artifacts so you don't have to manually go in and do it. Nice, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really forgot the jive that it was kind of very devops -y kind of focused. Yeah, the authors, I think all of them are very DevOps focused. Okay, yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, the next one really was the first one that really shocked me. Trunk-based development methods. How many of you has, have heard of trunk-based development methods? A couple, okay. Uh, do you guys do trunk-based development? No, Paul? Um, I've moved into a kind of a different position, so. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I think we have done. So uh, trunk-based, for those who are not familiar with it, trunk-based development, I feel is like, kind of the opposite side of the spectrum from like Git flow or like very branch heavy workflows where you'd have like, you know, if you were, so yeah, if you're working on a new feature, you'd create a feature branch on your local machine and then you'd, you'd push it to origin and then you merge with like a, say a release branch or something like that. And, and then you end up merging down to, I guess, I don't even remember. I, I, you know, everybody has a different way of working, but you usually end up kind of keep merging things together until you finally get to a production branch. Trunk base is the opposite, where um, actually the people who I've heard from who love it the most, everybody develops off of master or main. And they're pulling like every couple hours, every few minutes, depending on the developer. And so you're, the, way they, the thing they love about it is that they're always in tune with that, what everybody else is doing. And if there are merge problems, then you're talking with somebody and saying, hey, what's going on? And, and there's more collaboration, more communication, which, uh, yeah, I'm very curious about because I, uh, my last company was the closest we've come to this, and but we we would essentially, the practice was we would not be pulling every, say, day or so. It it would be, we kind of develop our feature on our master branch, <laughs> and then, mer you know, pull <laughs> and try to merge and then push it all thing together. So it was a little bit more difficult, but. Um, so you're, you're, mer you're merging sooner in the process of that you're saying rather than near the end. Yeah, so the idea would be you're merging, you're making small changes, or you know, you, like you're, you say you commit every, you know, the, the people who do the, seem to do the best with it make very small commits and they pull as often as they can. And so. You're maintaining your update. You're, you're maintaining your, trunk. your alignment with the trunk. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, <clears throat> developer on a team is created like, treated like its own entity. 
Yeah. And they're like, they're doing their own work, they're doing their own story, and it's like, oh, if I have to ask for his help, I'm interrupting his work on his story. But it like, really, it's the same product. So we're one team. And if you have to do small commits, and you say like, you have a work in progress feature, this probably makes you implement feature flags. Yeah, absolutely, right? yep. Which is like a big bonus. Like, you got feature flags, now you can do CICD really easily. Yep. Yeah. So this, and then if something breaks, you have to immediately talk to your team. Yeah. And so it's like it basically relies on the team, you get a better idea of what everyone's doing immediately, and you feel more combined, and it enforces each of life. Like, yeah, I mean, totally get. I'm like I wouldn't even have thought of this, but yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And it's so funny to me because it's like the opposite of what I was taught. Because like I remember when, um, you know, like, like GitFlow and um, I don't remember, you know, like these different methodologies were, I guess when, when I was really kind of getting into serious development, like I heard all the, these people saying like, oh yeah, you want to like have all these branches so that you don't, you, you're, you don't have as many merge uh, 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 conflicts, thank you. And, and so you don't have to implement feature fat flags. And, you know, I, I don't know if they said keep things simpler, but like in retrospect, looking at this, I'm like, especially once I worked on a project that had um, like so many, like they, not only did they, did they have like feature branches, they had, I can't remember the names of them, they had like 10 different categories of branches because there was like, there, there were uh, releases, but there, there were like, like essentially if two features were, were conflicting, then there was an additional branch to, to layer to go up, and they still had more and more layers to kind of resolve all these things. I, mean, I can't tell you how many hours I've spent um, having conversations on like which branch to deploy from, and yeah. to up on, and all that stuff. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, it is simpler. Yeah. There are, there are issues that like you're forced to deal with. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so that's trunk-based development. Uh, next, test automation. How many people have test automation where they work? One, a couple, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so yeah, a lot of uh, wishy-washy hands, I guess, yeah. Um, honestly, I've never worked at it. Uh, there has been one team I've worked on that has been test-driven. Like, uh, I don't know if it's 100%, but I do know, like, significantly. And it was my first job and it, they were developed, we were split into two teams. So there was a back end team and a front end team. And I was on the front end team and we had no tests because we didn't know how to do tests in the front end. So I've never had to, to, to uh, be uh, beholden to like see it test driven or, or like a, a, a well, uh, up until my last job, never really had a serious like worry about tests. But at my last job, we had automated tests, which was great, but they were very slow. QA tests that were not in our code, they were outside. So I was happy that they were automated, but um, I feel like I, I love, like kind of what you're saying, like I ended up introducing um, te Python tests into it so that I could get that feedback that we kind of talked about before, getting the quick iterative loop. And I was worried that that was gonna be unpopular because everybody would have to start putting tests in, but when they started realizing how quick the loop was, it, it was so great. Is this different from test-driven development? I think it is. Yeah. Well, it automatically problem? runs the test every time you check in. It would automatically oh, okay. run the test. Oh, well, you're still you're still you're still, still developing, developing the test. You're still like, developing the test. Yeah. yeah. My my favorite thing that I've done with this is Docker tests. Right? Hmm. Having a Docker Compose file and basically black box testing like a monk, so it's like an API and just like. I shove things into the API, it gets the right output. And if, when you're doing Docker, you can be like, okay, well, I can, I can run my Jenkins job. The Jenkins job will spin up my, my API, its dependency APIs, and I can call into my APIs from my test suite. It'll do the database functions. I can load up the same database every time. It was just magical. It was That's like, cool. Very nice way of doing it because I can run those same tests locally. I can run them in there, there, and then like, oh, what happens if I have a dependent API? I can just load that up too, 
and just kind of was cool. Thanks. Paul? It's tricky, though. I mean, hmm. this, there's a lot that's underlying this. I mean, hmm. test automation, you know, how deep are you going to go? I mean, you've got unit tests, you've got integration tests, you've got, you got user acceptance tests, you've got um, UI testing. Mm -hmm. um, so how deep do you want to automate things? And the deeper you go, the harder it becomes. Mm -hmm. And um, and then um, you know everyone can look at this and say, yeah, that's great. Let's get test automation. And you spend a lot of time. You know, then you then you create a process. Say, okay, we're going to have test automation. We're going to have 100% coverage, and we need to have 100% coverage by X date. And and developers create 100% coverage by X date, and they go, okay, X equals Y, true. You know, and, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that's you know that's the reality because developer. I mean, because again, it goes back to the, like you don't get evaluated or you don't get credit for automating tests. You get yep. credit for producing something new. Yeah. Tests aren't new. They just you know, and so you you do it as quickly as possible to meet the metric. You click the box and you go forward. Yeah. I, I also think there's a correlation of test value based on the complexity of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I was asked to write tests for, and I was like, why? I had a <coughs> GitHub bot, and it was just like, I create, it would interface directly with the GitHub API, and it was just like, well, what am I supposed to be testing? I'm literally calling directly into the GitHub API. You just want me to like mock the entire GitHub API? Like, <laughs> yep. Nothing to test. Yeah. For this component, and you're asking me to write tests for it, and you're like, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, I don't like when it's like, oh, well, we need 100% test coverage, and it's like you're not actually. That's about that's the that's the stuff. challenge. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. that's what I mean. You know, it's there's a lot within underneath this these two words. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, um, one of the um, one of the women who I learned a lot about all this is uh, Emily Bache. And she has a, a, a conference talk that I just watched about this um, because uh, essentially it's about how do you do test automation in a um, event-driven microservices environment. And I thought it was fascinating because she was talking about, I can't, actually I don't even know if she named what company she was working for, but there are you know, all these development teams that are working on different things and they have to be you know, integrated and, and delivered and their pipeline was so slow um, that it held people up, especially if you know, like if one team was developing something and then somebody else was developing something, and, and they had they didn't realize they were depend codependent on each other. Like at some point, you know, somebody would m merge in, and then this team couldn't yeah. uh, collaborate. And so she she had some really interesting things I thought too. For if anybody's you know interested in like thinking about like how to kind of coordinate some of that, she had some really interesting things, which was essentially to, to kind of actually I thought it was interesting to essentially each step of the way was like um, she would start off by running like the unit tests in like a, in one gate um, so it was just quick quick feedback and then the next one was just slightly more complicated like I guess uh, integration tests or something like that and then I don't remember what they all were but it was like you know quick feedback and then <coughs> each gate was would be more expensive and then actually delaying the point where you merge the two co uh, teams together which anyway if if anybody wants to know about it, let me let me know. I can send you the link. Uh, but it's Emily Beach testing microservices or something like that. Anything else before we move on? Yeah. One of the things they talk about with test automation in particular is um, timing, and so making sure that your tests don't take too long to run. Yes. And they just mentioned that those high-performing teams have a limit on. I think it's like 10 minutes for the total test suite. Okay. And so yeah. that gives you quick enough feedback that people aren't feeling blocked when they're merging PRs or, or, or merging it all yet, trying to figure out where the code will go in. Nice. That's smart. And hard at the same time, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, number four, receive customer feedback. Um, I thought this was interesting, you know? Like, and it makes sense to me. Like, I actually like knowing when I've done something that helps somebody or hurt somebody, you know? Like, actually have like a, you know, like there's a human that's using my thing and oh shoot, I introduced a bug or something like that. Like, or even better, like the, uh, 
uh, shoot, what's it called? Like when you actually watch, observe somebody use your thing. Like I would love to do that someday just because I, I, I'm sure it would blow my mind to see how they, they use a, a website. But does anybody work, get customer feedback from what they use? Yeah? Yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Probably too much, huh? Uh, it varies. It's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a nice mix of both the software and the data. So it's... Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because that's the other thing I was thinking about this. Like we were talking about how the last slide, there was, there was a depth of complexity beneath those two words. I feel like this could be, you need the right Goldilocks zone of not too little, not too much. Yeah. And just like they're not like, oh, I have to talk to the dead sort of thing. It's just like they're like, why is this stupid button not working? You're like, okay, well, it was, you know, kind of like working with a, like another developer as if they were the customer. Or something like that. Word. Word. Yeah. So I want to ask, through, like, does anyone have an opinion on like where to draw the line between? Like teaching your user how to use your application versus like saying, let me see you use it and see like if this is intuitive. It's like there's some things that are more, I guess, technical in nature that like maybe a basic user would need a little instruction to do, but you also don't want it to be overcomplicated and want like valuable feedback from that interaction. Has anybody been in that situation? I will say that if your customer thinks it's too hard or frustrating to use your thing, they will make a workaround. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they will not tell you that workaround. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Um, and so, like, if a customer like tells you something about it that they don't like, or you can't immediately see that they like using it, it's problematic. Because they will quickly make a workaround for, for things they find efficient. Unless yeah, your product is They'll figure out how to do what they want to do, even though it may not be exactly the most ideal way. But they'll figure it out. I mean, people are smart enough to figure out software, I think, mm -hmm. generally. Um, but you know, it's, so it's that would be interesting to watch them. It's like, well, I have to do it this way because, you know, and, and then you could say, oh, well, that's not what we're looking for. Yeah. That's not yeah. really what I intended. I was like, oh yeah, well that that doesn't make sense. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think. Two things for that. I think one, the more you can get feedback and kind of like iterate, and so get feedback and then implement what you were talking about, like instructions, things like that, that maybe address that feedback and kind of iterate, like do cycles of that. That's really valuable. I think the other thing that I've heard a lot, both in software and then in gaming as well, is the customer knows what their problem is, they don't know what the solution is. So mm -hmm. a lot of times they'll tell you, like, this is wrong, here's how to fix it. A lot of times they'll be wrong about how to fix it, but the problem is the problem because they are the customer, like they're mm -hmm. using the thing. So don't always take their, their advice on what to fix, or like how to fix it, mm -hmm. but what to fix. You know, there, there's a problem there, and especially if multiple people are saying it. Like, take that serious, but I also, yeah. when you say customer feedback, it's like you're expecting that they're just going to give you the answer. Yeah. <laughs> I think you need to ask specific questions of people to get them to actually be like, oh, well, I see you're using this product, but like, do you enjoy this feature? And then be like, I don't use that feature. Mm -hmm. you know, like, okay, well, why not? Are you, like, that's important for the type of work you do, so why aren't you using that feature? Um, so like, totally. test, test the assumptions that you use when you're yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, and, and I can't remember the phrase of like what, what it is when you like observe people, you, know, like you, you have like an experiment where you just, you know, somebody is, you know, you've got a user at the keyboard or whatever, and you have somebody give them directions. Uh, does anybody, does that? Are you call customer experience testing? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I guess so. When you're looking at them like through a one-way 
the mirror and see how they're using the system? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I feel like it is. Either way, um, what I was thinking of is like, you, like I always want, I, I would love to be a part of that one day, but I, I think it's fascinating how like that in and of itself is its own like field of study with its own you know subtleties, you know? And yeah, like not trying not to lead the people and stuff like that, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, number five, experimentation. Very critical, I think, for, for fun and job. Who, who here gets to experiment in their day job? Sometimes, yeah? A couple, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel like this is a, uh, I wonder, there, so there was one team that I was a part of that we did, got to experiment a lot, but we were the, the innovation team, so it was almost like what we were expected to do. But like, I feel like this is, I'm very curious how the, the book talks about it because I feel like in a way this is a, a privilege, like a, a you know, thing where you can you, you you can do it, but not all the time. Is, is that kind of what the book kind of? Comes I actually to? don't remember this one. Mm. Like, I don't remember the specifics of this. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but definitely sounds fun to me. <laughs> uh, next, improved processes. I think this is a big one that I wanted to get to. Oh, experimentation. Yeah. Um, this is something that I've been pushing for. Is the idea of like testing or experimenting, like <clears throat> that there is a little bit too much expectation of success mm -hmm. when like failure should be normalized. Yeah. Um, like it should be okay to fail within a certain tolerance, right? Yeah. It should be worthwhile to expect that I'm going to fail 50% of the time if I can increase like efficiency by a certain amount, you know, like that should be built into that. And as part of that, it's like experimenting. Well, like maybe half your team hates the technology you're using, for example. Maybe maybe one person, it's worth spending a week have one person try something else, see what they like about it. And then went to the team and see if people are like, well, I left that thing or not. And use it in a controlled fashion to another larger experiment or try something else. Like, there, there's not as much experimentation outside of startups and where you are the sole person working on that thing and you can basically, you have like free reign of, of doing that stuff. And I've been in that situation and it's like, it's great it's to be able to control the stuff that you're working on. But in larger teams, it's very hard to do experimentation because like the decisions are all made for you. Yeah. 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 Sometimes you also you almost need like a tectonic shift in order to like I think this is also I feel like this is relevant to like the code improvement day. Like like you're spending ten percent of your time on code yeah. improvement, you also should allocate a certain amount of your time to experimentation. Definitely. Yeah, and the more I think about it too, like have you when you're saying that, because I, I was thinking about you know, like uh, there, the, when I was on the innovation team, we got to experiment a lot. And then I transferred to two other teams in the same company. And one of them, I think we had some, like I had, uh, so one of them, I was able to do some experimentation, but like essentially nobody else was because they had like, they were behind delivering features. And then the other one just didn't have a culture of it. And I bet that, that both of those teams would have been, enjoyed it. But yeah, I don't know. I guess what I was thinking of too is like, everybody on the team is on a different point of their uh, developer journey. And I think we could all learn from each other and you know, each person could there, could, there could be some, you know, may not be as big of a, a experiment, you know, might, might have, I don't know. Yeah. You know, and especially failing in front of your team and like other things. You know, speaking up. Speaking up is another thing, like because if someone thinks I'm wrong, <laughs> you know, that's a that's kind of like a failure. Yeah. So like trying something and being like, no, this was not a good experiment or kind of a waste of time. It's like no, it's not a waste of time. It's experiment. Exactly. You learn something. 
great. Uh, yeah, improving processes. And this is, I think, what I wanted to, one of the things I wanted to get back to where we were talking about agile and things like that. You know, like sometimes it seems like our processes are etched in stone, but they shouldn't be. But I also, like, I feel like I worked at a place where we fully ran with that. We we're like, yeah, we're not going to write down our processes because they're going to be ever evolving. And then we didn't have any, like, you know, we couldn't depend on anything because we're like, well, let's try something for this time and everything. And it was horrible. Uh, but I feel like that's the exception. I don't know that I've ever been on a place that was so experimental. <laughs> um, how about, how about, yeah, like uh, Roland, does that kind of, I don't, I know we were talking about the agile thing a good yeah. bit. Um, well, I've, I've always worked for big companies and I think the shame yeah. in big companies is, is that when you're communicating with 300 people, um, communicating what a process is is important because otherwise everybody's dancing to a different very true. dance, you know, and nothing's working. So I think it's hard, it's hard to improve process because half the team is still trying to figure out what they should be doing yeah. you know, at the company. So I think that what happens a lot of times in big companies is, is that um, they'll follow the bouncing ball, right? You know, they, they started with waterfall and they did that for 10 years and they didn't like that, so now they're now they're, now they're following Agile, but everybody's dancing a different Agile, and <laughs> yeah. you don't always get the benefits from it, and yeah. all the problems I told you about with architect and ever being done, and the yeah. you create from that. So it's in it, big companies, it's hard to it's hard to improve processes because um, people don't even know what the current process is to be with. You know? mm -hmm. And they're a big ship with a very small rudder. It takes a long time to change things, yeah. I will say that I think the, what tends to happen is that people try to add complexity mm -hmm. to improve process. And I realized this recently that they, they come up with these things. They're like, oh, what, what, what's the process for my team? Like, everyone does this, everyone does this, everyone does this. Okay, well, you just added four rules. And those rules, everyone has to remember those rules. Each developer probably has a different personality, so those rules might not work for everyone in the same. And, like, that's, you're adding a lot of complexity and a lot of overhead to your system. So, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know the, good, the right answer, but it just seems like, the first thing they, that people want to do is throw complexity at the, the problem. Yeah. Well, I think that you know you get in, in agile organizations that you can you can adopt agile because that's the or that's the way to quote the way to do software these days. Yeah. And then the processes get ingrained, and, and then people lose sight of what the process is there for. Yes, right. absolutely. And, you know, and and so and then. To the point that at which it doesn't become useful. Yes. And so, I mean, back to my point, like as you were saying, not introducing processes, but looking at the processes you have and looking at what they're used for. And if they're not useful, get rid of them. Yeah. Just, I mean, if you have the power <laughs> oh my God. in your own team, <laughs> yeah. just get rid of them. Yeah. Just like, okay, we're going to simplify things. It's like, this is what we want to define what you want to get out of this process. And if it's not giving it to you, chuck it. If it is, or if you, if you think it can, change it a little bit and, and keep it. Because, I mean, I think the daily stand-up is something that could be useful. But, you know, if no one has anything to share, don't spend half an hour. Spend 10 minutes and let people get back to work. Seriously. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I, I was listening to a podcast this week where somebody was talking about how they found the, um, I don't know, it wasn't an Agile Manifesto, or wherever it was, it was like the original document that explained what the stand-up uh, meeting was for. And they read it out loud at the stand-up meeting, and all of a sudden, the stand-up meetings lasted five minutes. Because people just assumed it's a meeting. It, we, you know, we, we don't actually stand up anymore. We're all just talking, you know? And um, it was transformative for their team. And I was just like, oh my god, yeah. Yeah. In fact, I bet it would be good to like read it every six months just to <laughs> remind people. 
Um, but I think, Roland, I think you had a really good point about large uh, companies, especially enterprises and stuff. Like, I, th I feel like um, the one I worked at was, had adopted the safe um, pattern of Agile, uh, which is like scaled, Agile, I don't even remember what it all stands for, but it's framework. Maybe. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's like, um, reg you know, regular Agile, you could kind of explain like with like a, oh, here it is, you know, like kind of like a circle, right? Where you like, you, you do something, you iterate and it all like this. This thing like on its homepage has this huge graphic that's like super complex with literal trains running through it saying that it's like a, a release train engineer. And I mean, it's just like I was, the first time I saw it, I thought it was mocking something. And then, and I laugh out loud, and the guy's like, "What are you talking? What are you laughing at?" He's like, "He's like, no, this is what we're really doing." And I'm like, "Oh my god!" Um, and to the point where it's like, you know, like, yeah, like every team has to like schedule things out like 18 months ahead, and somehow that's agile, <laughs> to so that other teams know what they're going to be working on. Um, and of course, you know, it can't change. Uh, so um, what we're trying to say, yeah. So I feel like there's like a certain degree too that like when you get like. I don't want to say bureaucracy, but like different layers in there. People want to protect their teams and themselves, and they just go along with the flow sometimes. And so, yeah, maybe. I think there's a lot of, I think it was raised earlier, I think there's a lot of value to deciding how your team is going to work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As long as the touch points outside your team are met. You know, so as long as you can deliver what you need to so somebody else can build their feature with your feature, or whatever the case may be, uh, then you can do what you want within your team that works for you. Yeah. But if you're doing, if you're doing with, if you're, if you're defining for your team what Agile is, and you're not meeting those touch points, what's, what's the purpose? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the big struggle of big companies. How yeah. to define those touch points. Yeah. And still being effective within your team. Exactly. So a, lot, a lot of, like, autonomy is one of those things that, like, mastery, autonomy, those are, like, the, the, the core things to, like, getting good at something and enjoying it, right? Yeah. And when you talk about touch points, I started thinking about, you know, the like inputs and outputs of the program. It's like inputs and outputs of the team. Like if the inputs and the outputs are the same, why should you care what's in the middle? Right? Sure. And yeah. 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 I think that would be it'd be cool if that was the case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think that's kind of what I, what I hope is the, well, like what we saw about Alex Everloof at the beginning, like his team transformed themselves and then it started spreading throughout the organization. I, I feel like I may be a little optimistic, but I like, I, that's what my hope is for you guys. If you, you know, like if you work on a team, maybe we can transform the team and we'll see if other people can pay attention and be wrapped up in it. Uh, number seven, manage work in progress limits. And I feel like in some ways this is kind of some kind of resonates with um, the previous one, you know, like I feel some of these kind of do have some resonance between each other, but like, like one of the teams I worked on, uh, we were expected to hit, I can't remember what it was, I think it was like 32 story points every two weeks. And it was like, it was like that, our velocity was a, was a stick to beat us with, you know, whereas like at my last job, when we transitioned, we went from a uh, Kanban style where we actually didn't even like do any story points. We were just like, we're, now we're working on this and then we just kept moving things over. Um, our CTO stepped in and was like, nope, now we're doing Scrum and, and made us do story points. And I was just like, you know, like, I trust you, but I've been burnt by this before and this is why I'm scared of doing this. And he's like, oh yeah, totally, that was wrong. Like, it should be a carrot. Like, it should be like, this. the idea of, story points is in theory and, and, and velocity is that it gives you at least a, it gives those who are not developers an idea of how long things might take and therefore like have a sense of, uh, you know, have more evidence to suggest like in say four months we might be able to do this or that, you know, but still being able to know like things could flex. So I was thankful that for his perspective because you know, I feel like no, whenever you have a number, people want to like game it or, or, you know, beat people over the head with it sometimes. Anyway, that's my perspective on work in progress limits. How about you? Yeah, I have these grooming sessions and they're probably like the worst part of my week. 
Yeah. Because it's like a voting game, you know, like. Yeah. If you, you go all vote on it, and if you are off of the average, you get asked why you think it's off of the average. And I don't know who it's for, because it's like, they, we want to go through all these stories and just apply a number value. And that seems to be the, the desired outcome is to put a number value, not to have understanding. Um, of the stories, like they would say, like, oh, we want to understand these, but clearly the goal, based on how the meetings are run, is that our goal is to put number values on as many of these things as possible yeah. at the end of this hour. Yeah. Um, and it just feels like a project management thing. Like it's, we're doing this purely for project management and not for the betterment of the project. Yeah. Especially because when you when you're wrong, you when you're wrong in the in that you underestimate, it's worse than if you overestimate, and it can. So I want to overestimate. That that yeah. At least that's what I try to do sometimes. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think this one is slightly different than Ooh. your interpretation. Yeah. I think this one kind of goes back to trunk-based development. Oh yeah. And the idea is to manage work in progress, meaning don't have a ton of long running work in progress. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and I'm going to use this to go back to trunk based development because I couldn't remember what all these were. And so I was pulling off because I, I didn't want to like get to it later and, or like have you address it later. But one of the things that I, I should say, I, when I read about trunk based development, I had a lot of conflicting feelings about it because on one hand, similar to this, like I can think of something that happened at work recently where someone turned in a thousand line PR change. And I was like, and then it ended up being complicated. There ended up being some things that were like caught in testing later. And it's like, well, yeah, because it was a thousand lines. Like that's really hard. But I also don't like, so I do think maybe PR should be smaller. But at the same time, I also think there's a lot of work to be done to do that. So it can be really hard to upfront create these issues that are that small to mm -hmm. break all these things down. Like mm -hmm. That's a lot of extra work that needs to get done. And so one of the things that I was disappointed about this book is the book is very much about a survey that they ran and it's talking about what high functioning teams do versus low functioning teams. It doesn't talk a lot about the specifics of how to get from low functioning to yes. high functioning yes. and the specifics of how those things work. Yeah. And one of them for trunk based development, and like I've read uh, Martin Fowler's article about continuous deployment and trunk based development multiple times actually, and I still don't understand how those teams function unless they're talking about like, well, I guess I understand part of it, which is they. A lot of them seem to really like pair programming. Yeah. And they talk, but I don't know. I, okay, here's my other conflict with this is I agree with the statement that developing software on a team that is in person and, and like paid to do the same thing at the same time should probably be different than developing open source software where you have to like, you don't know anyone's schedule and you have to like, so that's like, that's where a lot of this came from is the, like, you don't know when someone's going to deliver something. So you want to break that off, make it its own thing. Like, I think that's where a lot of Git flow came from. Honestly. Yeah, I think so. But at the same time, like, I don't think we necessarily should run teams that way that work together on the same thing. But I also feel like there's a lot of value in me going off by myself and writing something and someone else reviewing it with clean eyes. Like, I'm not saying that you shouldn't hire a program or like, I, I sometimes enjoy talking things out with my teammate, but like, I also think maybe code review is a good thing and they seem to think that it should be more, it should happen more quickly and it shouldn't necessarily be that way. And I don't know how I feel about that. I'm not trying, I like, I don't have a, a solution. That was one of the things I really felt was lacking in the book and I, I still haven't found good discussions of that online that really hmm. dive into it. Mm -hmm. They do have one section at the end of the book where they talk about a high functioning um, group, but I felt like it was too surface level and I didn't really get as much out of it as I would have liked in terms of specifics. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, because like that's something I'm, I've been digging into some, um, especially what really um, kicked it off for me was I was uh, one day I was on social media and I 
saw, I think it was whatever, somebody was watching a, had just watched a um, conference talk. I think it was Claire Sub, Subsidy, Sub, Sudi, I can't remember her last name. Um, and she did a talk that was called CICD or Continuous Integration. It's, it, it's, uh, it's some perspective of like, it means something different than you think it does or something like that. And she was, this guy was like reacting to it saying, for the last few years, I've told you guys you should be using branches. And after watching this talk, I must say I've been completely wrong. And so it was a very transformative thing for him. And I watched the talk and she does kind of talk about a number of things that I thought were interesting, but like, I feel like, you know, like it, this is this, uh, the trunk based development in particular is like something that I'm like, I'm, I'm looking for content out there to try and understand yeah. it better because it does seem, you know, like kind of saying like the, the people who seem to like it and who work best seem to like realize it, it's a communication tool, you know, and, and the other part too is the, um, I can't remember, there's another guy in the software development ecosystem that came up with this uh, acronym that was like MMSSS. No, MMMSS, MM, three M's, two S's. Many, many, many smaller steps. And so like that's the mantra that like the teams kind of followed to say like, all right, you know, I'm doing one little thing and I'm committing it, one little thing and committing it, which also feels like a lot of overhead too. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's the thing. Like. <clears throat> Theoretically, I, I really like that idea of many, many smaller steps, but I would love to see how that works in practice because it feels like it's a lot of extra work to get there. And maybe yeah. it's just worth it, but I haven't been on a team that's done it that way, um, so I don't have a good, like... Well, I imagine, I imagine a breakdown of problem that you're trying to solve with yeah. a lot of many steps. Yeah. You're doing some architecture and some design of your problem before you can make what the little steps are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. And there's a good part of that, yeah. but it's, it's certainly a lot of work up front that's going to require you to maybe turn things around a little slower. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure which is better, but it's not going to be boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And I think if you, can, if we, if you don't do that break, you do? what happens is you get a, you uh, get a team. I do. Is constantly dealing with each other's problems on the front. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, this wasn't complete, and uh, it's been pushed, and oh my God, I broke this thing over here. Yeah. And, and I think that's why that's why the uh, that's why the Git process was developed because I can develop something in isolation, and once I'm once I'm happy, it's well along the way, yeah. then I can commit it because it's not going to screw anybody else up. Yeah. So it's a it's a weird trade-off, you know. I'm not yeah. sure which is better and, and which which uh, gets us to a good place. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and then I think really what it comes down to is every team's different. Yeah. And it's worth experimenting. I, I, but I feel like, God, it's like, this is one of those things where it's like, I, I really wanted to try it on my last team. But like, I know it would be such a culture shift to do it. And, and especially when my manager is like, oh, well, we got essentially already do that. And I'm like, you didn't quite listen to me when I explained it. So, yeah. Experimentation, I guess. <laughs> All right, let's get to number eight. Uh, having a learning culture. Um, yeah, does anybody feel like they have a le learning culture at work? Yeah, nice, a couple of pamphlets, excellent. How, how does it feel? I, one thing I really like, uh, so I just started a job in January, and one thing I really like about the way that the meetings are set up, I feel like we don't have a ton of meetings, which is great. And then what we do have every Monday, it's just called the engineering meeting. And it's kind of, uh, it can be whatever, so people just present topics. Mm -hmm. And a lot of like, sometimes it'll be, actually this week was interesting, we had documentation, so there are some people that are focused on, we have technical writers, so they just presented like, here's how we do some of the documentation, here's some of the stuff you should look at, here's our process a little bit. So it was like 15 minutes on that. And then the other one was um, Rob presented on HTMX and streaming elements actually, so similar to the stuff, yeah. Um, but anyway, he just said like, here's how I implemented this thing. I thought it was kind of neat. And so it was like a deep dive on code. And so it's, um, that meeting ends up being a lot of the learning culture of like, here's what I did, or like, here's what we should think about, um, things like that. And so I, I really like that discussion aspect of it. Yeah. Like, you also kind of show and tell aspect of it. Of like, yes. I might not have been able to, you didn't review this code, but, and it's not everything, but it's, it's like, um, when you have a big thing or even just something interesting, 
You saying that reminded me that there is a um, design agency that I heard about back in the early 2000s or so, where I, I imagine they got a space kind of like this, and um, but I think it was more of like um, gutted, and they put a glass wall down, like roughly, I don't know, 20% in or something like that. And they put like essentially like a workshop in that half. So it was, you know, wood, you know, all, all, or all, all sorts of, um, tools and stuff in there and because like the, the two founders were like if our designers and developers just do nothing but like design and develop they're going to get burnt out and so they set up a rotation where every week a new person would go in and a new person would go out and you would be you spend two weeks in that side of the of the space um, creating a project whatever it is you want. Like some people made electronics, some people you know, made like a mailbox or whatever. It was like you spent the first couple of days coming up with something. Actually, I think they, it, yeah, I think it was like three days because they, they said most people the first day they're like, they feel like they need to like go back and do something. And they're like, no, 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 get your head out of there, you know, kind of a thing. And um, I just, you know, they, they said it was transformative for the team. And I, I was just thinking like that kind of meeting is awesome when it's self-sustaining. Because so many places I've been in have had that meeting on the books, and like every like this, after like a couple months, it just every week it gets canceled, canceled, canceled. Um, but yeah, like if you can fuel somebody to like experiment or something like that, that sounds really good. All right, next is going to sound familiar. Collaboration. Um, who here feels like they have a collaborative culture at work? Yeah, a couple of shaky hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, tell me about it. What what's uh, what's good? What's 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 suffering? Well, I'll go. I'll talk about what I've experienced. Is like I, I feel like what you said was um, really big, which was um, a lot of times I need to collaborate with somebody, but I don't want to bother them. Um, I know some teams who have Zoom up all the time, and it's like they just have one or two. Or three, or say two, or five, up to five people, like in a Zoom chat, or you know, meeting, but no one's saying anything until something comes up, and they're like, "Oh, what's going?" You know, and they're able to immediately like talk, which I thought was interesting. Um, but yeah, like I don't know. It's like I feel like, and and then I, and then on the other end of the spectrum, I've heard. Well, I shouldn't say on the other end of the spectrum, considering what I just said. But you know, I've definitely worked at jobs where it's like we're all like individual. I was by myself, I did my thing, I contributed the code, and we hardly ever talked. And I know of teams who do the opposite, and they've done ensemble programming the entire time, um, too, which also blows my mind that you, you could do. Well, honestly, I, 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 the, after having done it a couple more times, I can see how it could be sustainable, but also still, it's just like, it seems a little intense. But yeah, I don't know, I wanted to open this up to any more tales of collaboration. Yeah. We have a lot of overlapping responsibilities, so, you know, we have, I mean, I'm involved in both marketing, but also with technical stuff, and, you know, sometimes it's marketing people having questions, and other times it's, uh, uh, you know, something, you know, related to database updates. Yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, Paul, like kind of what you're saying, too, about whiteboarding, too, like, I, I feel like, as developers, we probably tend to under-collaborate. Um, and or collaborate on a lower level and being able to bring it up a little bit more could be. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I mean, you're, you, you kind of put these two extremes on, you know, intense collaboration with ensemble programming and no collaboration, everyone in their cubicle. I mean, I think there's, there's ranges there too. Yeah. In the middle and you can have um, a facade of collaboration. <laughs> yes. Know, we're collaborative, you know, I want to hear what you have to say until, you know, uh, but, but we can't do it at this time and then, oh, schedule some time on my calendar. Oh, I'm going to cancel that because I, I'm so busy doing this other thing. And, and, but, but you need to check in with me all the time, uh, but you can only check with me at this point. But then when you do to check in with me at that time, I'm not available because I've left. So it's, it's, it's really, you know, I think that 
you could see, th you could pretty quickly determine whether your team is collaborative. I mean, I could be collaborative at, within my own team, um, within the, the group that I manage, but at the higher level, when I was trying to collaborate with other people, it was a little bit harder because it was always like, um, well, A, are you trying to take something of mine? Mm -hmm. um, or, oh, I don't have time, I'm too busy. Or like, what's in it for me? Um, and kind of this, this, this sort of pseudo-political game that has to be played. Totally. And so that's really, uh, it's been, a, it's been a it was a challenge. Uh, to, to deal with that, you know, and, and all with the facade of saying we're collaboration, we're, we collaborate with each other, we're all one big happy family. Well, yeah, you could say that, but, you know, reality shows me, you know, my, my eyes show me something different than what Yeah. So you're collaborating with one hand, but the other one's holding a knife in the back. An example of that today, uh, during stand up, I asked three questions, and then no one said anything. And then one person was like, well, just let me know if you have any questions. They were just like, okay, well, you know, the stand-up's not the place to talk about it, so it's just not going to be talked about, right? It's, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't know. Like, I, okay, just having a conversation or just be, being like, you start the conversation with me immediately and try to answer my questions, but it just feels like some of these things where you stop, you're just not listened to. And that's like clearly just you didn't hear me or you didn't care or you're like, well, you felt like the things that you were doing were more valuable than answering those questions or something. So and it goes back to like feeling like you can't talk to certain people. I think there's this like water cooler sort of thing that mm -hmm. is somewhat missing from um, remote work where it's the ability to read people's body language and an important part of collaboration for me is commiserating. And yes. If I can't like send you a stupid emoji and have you be able to get like a positive response from that or like at least play with me, you know, then like it's probably gonna be hard for me to do that kind of fully remote thing because it's like that's the small talk. There's yeah. like a small talk that has to happen, and then we can start talking about the real me. Yeah. Like why I'm talking to you. Because like, if you're at my work, like, I'm probably talking to you because there's a problem, and that commiseration part is like the lead up to having a real discussion about it. Um, and some people just won't play that game. They just be like, they have no tolerance for, for any of that. And, you sort of can get that in like a real world. When you, you read their body language, you can know whether or not you address them in a certain way, but it's a little bit harder to remote. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that's a pain point of like virtual standups, and I love remote work, so I'm not, I don't ever like want to raise a red flag about this, but like I'm guilty of this where I'll join standup, I'll enjoy the conversation, I'm truly listening to everybody talking about interesting things, but we get to talking about our work updates and as soon as someone who I'm not actually actively working on a project with starts talking about what they're working on, I shut off, I'm looking at Slack, I'm doing something else. Mm -hmm. And they might be asking a question that I can help them with because I've experienced there like several months back or something, but I won't hear it. And vice versa, I've asked questions and then it's just dead silent. And then yeah. it, it kind of stinks because you're like, is anyone listening? Like, or does no one know? You know, and then you ask again, it's, you know. There's, there's certainly highs and lows of working remote because it's like you get the right people and it just works, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like, I don't know. There's also highs of working in an office. Like, yeah. But I think part of it what comes down to ultimately, like, in most cases, you don't really want to work. So being remote is more like not working, right? <laughs> and so, and it's like being in an office, I don't know. It's just like there's, there's benefits to both. And uh, since going back to the office, I've been reminded of them. And thinking back on the places where I've worked, some of my best experiences were in the office. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think there's there's so many moments in the when you're working in an office that you're not necessarily working. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. 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 I used to come in early in the morning and I used to walk down to the cafeteria to get something to eat. And I would have 10 conversations walking back to my office. Yeah. And they couldn't be anything because I wasn't working on anything. And a lot of times those are the most valuable conversations I had. Yeah, I, I would say that I go into the office, like I have a commute. I have, like, I talk to people. I, like, I waste just as much time. <laughs> you know, like, I waste, like, time on those things. But is it really a waste? Because if I was at home, like, I don't know, get distracted by all sorts of random stuff anyway. So right. Or you might not have those conversations. Right. Yeah. yeah. You just don't have conversations with other people. Mm -hmm. I also think, um, so I worked a lot remotely even before the pandemic, hmm. but all of the times that I worked remotely before the pandemic, I had relationships with my team members in person before or during that. So I think the other thing that's difficult is, so this new job I started, we don't have any in-person meetings or, and, and currently there aren't any planned. I think they're talking about trying to get people together, but there's nothing <coughs> currently planned for like uh, an all hands in person or anything like that. And I think that's one thing that would go a long way is just being able to meet people in person because yeah. the, to your point about like the non-work talk, even if it's not every day, if it happens and you've had those conversations, I feel like you build rapport with people sure. and you understand them better. Yeah. And that goes a long way, even for a year of working with somebody remotely or you know six months or three yeah. months, whatever it is. But that, that time I always felt like, it, it kind of hit me starting this job. I was like, oh right, all those times that I've worked remotely before I've known people before we've gone remote. And also, so being able to uh, understand them better. Yeah. At the large companies, so, you know, I'm, I'm a capital one. So I have people at, on the West Coast, I have people in McLean, and it's like, I find that I have a much better working relationship with people that are in the office next to me. Mm -hmm. And then I do that, like, there's a couple of people that I can talk to that I work well with that I have not met. But as a whole, like, I have a better working relationship with the people that I have met. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, number 10, provide resources and tools that make work meaningful. Um, Somebody mentioned meaning, sense of purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel like this one is, uh, I love it. It's, uh, it could also be pretty challenging too, <laughs> just like all of them, right? <laughs> one place I interned at, they, they actually went through, they were like, you know, I, I was doing work on like spreadsheets or something like that. And they were like, the work you're doing matters and this is why. And they like traced it through where it was actually helping somebody's life. And I was like, oh, hey, that's really cool, you know? But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's funny because like I was thinking my last job, not so much. <laughs> but yeah, does anybody have any? Is, uh, well, first I should check in with you. Is this, do, am I jiving with what the book says? I, this is another one I don't remember the specifics of yeah. what they were talking about for the, the tools that make it meaningful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I imagine, I imagine it's not quite to the level I was thinking of, but like that's what came to mind for me. Like once that happened, I was like, yeah. But um, yeah, any thoughts? I feel like this is kind of like project dependent. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm on a team, like I've been on for <laughs> over two years now and I like really enjoy the people and that's kind of what keeps me there. But I have a tough time like having meaning towards the mission I'm working towards because it's really, I also work at Capital One and we're keeping Capital One from breaking the wall, which is good in some ways, but with the motivation of saving money. And yeah. If I, I don't wake up every day thinking like I, you know, I care if a bank's fine, you know, that's not, it's not like I'm saying, you know, helping someone too much. But totally. Yeah, I get it. But. Um, so I, I've been, I was laid off a couple of months ago. And so um, one, one of the places I was interviewing was here in Richmond. Actually, I canceled my interview, my first interview, because after interviewing with a couple of jobs, this place was a uh, lead generation for small businesses. And I was just like, I just can't get excited about marketing. I'm, I just, I just not going to interview. Yeah, um, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Well, we're getting deep into our time, so I just want this. These are actually all the 24 things that the book suggests. So I figured it would be best to like just grab 10 of them. But um, yeah, there's some 
definitely some interesting things in there that I, I'm, I'd love to lo know more about. Yeah. Very DevOps focused, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people attempt to make loosely, they, they put the right components in, but they don't actually make it loosely coupled. They like use techniques to loosely couple, but then they can tightly couple. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, good. Well, so like I got this off of the uh, Wikipedia yeah, page of, of Accelerate, but I kind of put all these up there just, I mean, it's like in some ways, like, you know, a number, I think I, f I feel like looking at all these, like th that's a lot. You know, and, and especially if you're working in a team that maybe has a couple like to think that like, you know, like maybe you don't even need all of them. Like, you know, like I, I feel like, you know, like one of the criticisms, I think like what you're saying, like it, it, I feel like the researchers, um, one of the things I'm concerned about with this content is that the researchers might, don't, may not, like you said, it was a survey, I think. And so I don't know how, like how deeply they researched into the different teams, um, but, a lot of these things do resonate with like with true, and so I think like as a, as a takeaway from this, like what about me? Like what can what can change your life? You know, and when I thought about like what to talk about, like the I thought of one other developer, um, me, <laughs> because of my story. Like I graduated with a graphic design degree. And I taught myself how to program through reading blog posts. And I'm gonna take my photo off there because it's just kind of weird to have me big up there. Um, but essentially, like, as I grew as a developer, I would share, store, share what I learned with people around me. And a third of the time, people would be like, yeah, yeah, isn't that cool? It's, it's fun. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, a third of the time, people would be like, oh, I hadn't heard of that before. That's, that's really cool, thanks for sharing. And then a third of the time, somebody would be like, that's true, but here's some nuance that you don't know. And so it even helped me to know further and it usually de deepened my relationship with them more. Um, and all that to say is that, you know, for you know, the vast majority of my career, I have this imposter syndrome of like, I'm new to this. I am, you know, I didn't graduate with a computer science degree. I don't know data science. I, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. And I always re relied on my senior developer. You know, I, I would even feel like the best thing I can do is like think through the problem and like come to them when I have an issue and say like, I've thought this through, here are two solutions I propose, just so that they could like not spend the time thinking about it, you know? And you know, sometimes I'd choose one of my solutions, sometimes they're like, you're thinking about this all wrong, like do this, you know? But I would rely on them. And then, and then came the day where my senior developer left. And I was the most tenured developer left. And that freaked me out. And honestly, for a couple of weeks, I didn't know what to do because, like, like I said, like, I, needed my, my, I needed somebody to defer to, somebody to like, answer my questions. And now I was the one who was supposed to answer for the team. And eventually I remembered that the podcast I listened to would say, like, the best thing you can do as a leader is invest in those around you. So I talked to my, my manager and I was like, I wanna create a, a, a meeting where once a week we learn together. And he's like, yeah, go ahead and do that. You know, so we, for one hour a, a week, we got together. Um, I, think the, I think the second weekend I ran out of content. So I'm like, I've always wanted to read this book. You guys wanna read it together? And they're like, yeah, okay. And um, the team was made up of like, the mo most senior developer was actually way more tenured than I was, but he was a contractor. And he knew like .NET backwards and forwards, but he was kind of like a probably advanced uh, intermediate Python developer. And then after that, you had like kind of maybe intermediate beginners and Python curious people. 
but the time that we had was transformative. Uh, I think part of it was because the team makeup, we were all various background, variety of backgrounds, and we had a couple of people who were willing to ask questions. And so sometimes we would come up, we're like, all right, we're gonna read this one chapter next time. And we didn't even get to the chapter because somebody was like, hey, I was doing this, I have a question about it. And we just have this great conversation about it. And just to see how people grew in that time, it was amazing. Like, I'm just so proud of that time. That said, that doesn't always work. Because <laughs> I was like, I figured out how to make teams great. And so I went to my next team and my manager wouldn't let us meet. We were way behind on a project and there was nothing to do with it. So, and I, that, I really had a hard time with that team. So I transferred to another team with a much better experience and it didn't work for them either. Cause well, I don't, I, I think that every team is different is really what it comes down to. But um, I feel like if you choose yourself, you can make a huge difference in your team. It might, you might be able to, obviously I feel like it's also a, uh, like I said, you know, like I, that team I went to immediately afterwards, I don't know that I would have made much more of a difference. Uh, I, I honestly, I take that back. I think I would have, I could have made more of a difference, but I didn't know essentially that the team was made up of people who either knew SQL or C sharp and were forced to learn Python. I just assumed everybody had known Python for a while. And so I didn't, I wasn't able to like, I was kind of above their heads, which I really regret, but um, I don't know just encouragement to like, choose yourself, give it a try. It's scary as hell, <laughs> but for me, at least it was really worth it. With that, that's all I have for tonight. Um, any questions, any thoughts? This was very different than my original sessions, but I mean, it's like it's way more to try to absorb. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would you like something more, more like this in the future, do you think, or? I, yeah, I think, I think so. You can't only do it every time. No, it's good to know. I, I will definitely, um, oh. Uh, I enjoyed the discussion, that's what I think. Yeah. Probably more of what I needed today, honestly. Good. Um, I liked uh, your the Improved Fridays oh, yeah. quite a bit. Um, the thing that I'm struggling with right now is docs. Um, and it's not like, like improved code quality. Improved code quality wouldn't, wouldn't fully solve the issue. It's like there's a core documentation problem that um, happened. It's like everything was docs and code quality for step. And I'm trying to like, be, because it was it was rushed to a certain net point, and then it's like handed over to a, and then team scales, right? So it's like, what do you do? Like, do you handle the docs? Do you get like everybody to be like rush the docs and like improve that, or do you be like improve the code quality? Like, I'm not I'm not quite sure. Like, I, when I first wrote this down, I was like, yeah, maybe like every other Friday, like. They, people find one thing to improve, like the docs or something, but then does that really help? I don't know. I feel like um, things that aren't measured aren't improved, or things that aren't annoying aren't improved. And I know of some teams who have incorporated documentation into their tests so that if, you know, if something new is introduced and it Fails in documentation fails like it's a, you can run through the documentation and you know it fails the thing. I don't know exactly if that's possible in your situation, but um, that's the first thing that comes to mind is like how can you make it a pain for the team that, that the team can recognize like yeah we need to. Like it's clearly an invisible pain, right? Now. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. Like the uh, there's a lot of things like oh you'll come up to speed you'll you'll learn the things but then. It's people talking like they already know such so some of the developers know the components so they like speak like obviously it's here and here and it's like well that's not written anywhere it's mm -hmm. not explained in the ticket and you're not volunteering this information so how am I supposed to know? Yeah. Yeah I've experienced that. I feel like every team's a little bit different. Um, 
but it's easy to kind of feel like you're in the wild, wild west, like you don't know where anything is. And even like when you have to use like another team service, it's not well documented. And then you have to ask them any questions. So it's almost like by asking those questions, you hope you're creating the pain point for the other team and they'll make better documentation, but it doesn't always happen. I was right. gonna say, bad docs, capital one. <laughs> no docs. No docs. <laughs> that's, that's true, yeah. Actually, we have this, this architecture diagram that's copied and pasted around a lot. But it's like this, it's spaghetti. It's, there's, there's one point where it costs across the river like three or four times a line. And I'm just like, it's not helpful. And it's just like read, write. It's like, what are you reading and writing? It doesn't tell me like the, the payload size, the frequency, the batch size, like just. It's chaos, yeah. Just chaos. <laughs> Sorry, I wanted to double check one. It's part of those, like, how to make, how do you get these, these things? Like, because I know, like, I've been on teams that I've enjoyed being on, and I know, like, that this work can be enjoyable, and then being on other teams where it's not the enjoyable things. You don't have the enjoyable things. And it's a problem in itself, and I love problem solving, but it's also like, it's the wild, wild west. You're like, how do I solve this problem? This, this thing is, I, it's broken yeah. in some way. How can I solve it? And how can I improve it? It's overwhelming, because I feel like when, those situ when you have those problems, like, it seems like the only way to solve it is you have to just go and do it like, and try and do everything on your own. Because like, how do you inspire your teammates to do those things too? Right. Um, and like, that's happened a bunch where like, we're trying to, we have to build out some documentation and like I, you know, I assigned some work to some teammates to like help share that load and then the documentation was just total crap. Like, you know, and it's like, I, you know, it's just one of those things that you have to like, uh, it's difficult. Yeah, to, I mean, I've also, you know, I've been at a lot of jobs in the last whatever years, uh, but it's, it's just really like, it feels like you have to put in a certain amount of effort. And if the rest of the team doesn't reciprocate that effort or doesn't like feed off of you, you're just like, well, you might as well leave and go to the next team because the spark wasn't here. Mm -hmm. And to what you're saying, Chris, like you had that one team and you met together and they all like were engaged and it, like that was like a magical hour, right? Yeah. Like that, ha you have to have the right people. Yeah. Have the right people at the right time in their lives, and for us that doesn't happen. And I think that's like a, a problem, not to make this all about Capital One, but it's like how we're incentivized, you know, is it to like do robust documentation, do, you know, do all these things that would make our experience better. It's about like how many, like how many presentations are you giving, how many like side of desk projects can you be on, and how can you contribute well beyond your team, and do all these ridiculous things. Yeah, I don't care about it. I, I could care less. It's like doing all this <laughs> stuff for cloud that like I could care less about. I want to be building features and like doing you know interesting things, but that's not what I don't know makes yeah, you successful. I, I make zero effort to to meet the the guidelines, so um, that's how I came into Capital One and how I intend to to, to hold myself is to just continue to do the things that I did that got me to be. <laughs> The kind of person that would be hired at that point. I, I think the things you're discussing, I'm thinking of two things that could improve the situation, one of which is not actionable, one of which is. I think the not actionable one is one of the ways you get better documentation and better like work is when people care about what they're mm -hmm. working on. And I think there are a lot of people at Capital One who don't care about the specifics of what they're working on. And so you like when you're pushing them to do docs, especially when it's not incentivized, mm -hmm. you're not gonna get that. I think the, the thing you can't, or like the, the one that's a little bit more actionable, probably not a capital one, is I think you get a lot of these things if you give people a little bit of slack, mm -hmm. where you have a little bit of extra time, so you have an hour to do learning, or you have, and for me, at my new job, I've been kind of taking it myself, because it's, the job is really, like the job is good, and they're not very, they're not like, 
okay, this needs to be done tomorrow. It's like, okay, what are you working on? All right, cool, you're making progress, good. And that's kind of it. And so as long as you're showing progress, you're showing that you're working, they're happy. And so I've taken some time to do some extra experimentation and things like that. And I've been able to because I have that slack. Yeah. And so I think if you're running a team, that's something you can implement and help out with. It allows for a lot of these things, I think. Allows that extra time. But it does take people to have that, or it takes people that have that desire to do those things, or even knowledge that they can. So like, I think some very junior people won't use that Slack wisely because they don't know what they can do and things like that. But mm -hmm. um, I think just giving people that Slack helps a lot because then people can kind of like enjoy what they're working on and be interested in it rather than just be like, okay, I gotta get this done. I can't think about what's gonna look like tomorrow or like what the, and, and like a better solution. It's just get it done, get it done. Uh, Michael Hyatt uh, um, has a, a metaphor that I really appreciated because he talks about like how a lot of times when we think about what we do for work is like kind of like a play. It's it's what's on stage, but like what you see on stage in a play is the result of hours and hours and hours of re rehearsal and and everything. And so he says, likewise, our lives there's a lot of backstage work that happens and stuff outside the theater. I can't remember, he has, he has a better metaphor than what I'm thinking. But like, yeah, like I think what you're saying is right dead on that like, especially as, as you grow, but I think no matter what, you need some of that experimentation time. You need to like set aside some part of the day to grow yourself or something. And I know for me, like that's something that I know is important and I still don't do it. Um, um, yeah, but here, here. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to share uh, a couple of uh, miscellaneous things from our talk. Um, so first off, this is the ad, this is like, you know, somebody's agile, you know, um, illustration to, to talk about, like, this is how agile works. It's a loop, you know, um, I haven't actually read it to see, like, if, if I agree or disagree with it, but like, I feel like what it's, without really digging into it, it feels about right, you know, because like it, agile is supposed to be an iterative process, it's one circle. Whereas safe, this literally is not mocking anything, this is their answer. <laughs> like, yes, like, uh, what a, a, a business agility and lean agile mindset core values are apparently a completely separate part from all this um i mean like what's that oh ai yeah yeah ai is over here of course I mean, it's clearly been updated recently it looks like buzzwords just i don't think how ai is along with roadmap and okrs yeah yeah. Like I, I can't I can't even, you know. There are two trains. They've added a second train to this. Where's another train? There's one here and one here. Yeah. Architectural runway looks pretty bumpy. Not to be confused with the solution train. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. This is <laughs> but there are, I guess there are, oh, uh, okay, there are, oh, oh I see that the, the, the uh, essential doesn't only have one train, but then the large solution. Anyway, so that's that. Um, uh, okay, this was the quote that I saw the other day that I thought was fascinating, um, where he vehemently defended future branching, and you know what, I was dead wrong, watching Claire Sudbury uh, has made me completely reverse my position. And so, oh, hey, I just saw that Claire wrote to him. Oh, nice. Um, I don't know Claire too well. I've, I've interacted with her sometimes. She, she seems like a really cool, really genuine person. Um, and the talk that he's talking about is this, continuous integration, that's not what they meant. Um, so if you're interested, that's... Can you, can you link that on the Discord? I will do my best to. I why don't I do it now before I forget? work we're trying to move to continuous integration 
Mm. There are discussions about it, but I am not in them currently, uh, but I've passed along a few links. So I, if this one's good, I, I would pass it along as well. Yeah. Plus I'm just interested because I'm curious to see how it works. I yeah. I literally had Discord running not that long ago. I can't believe there's six updates. Prior VA. Uh, I'll put it, I'll just put it in. I'll put it here in general. Thanks. And then one other thing is, uh, this is the Emily Beach end-to-end -end automation testing in a microservice architecture talk. If anybody is interested in it, I'll put it in the Discord as well. Yeah, that's all okay. Otherwise, I think that's it. Any other resources that we mentioned that? Oh, before I forget, um, so we're sponsored by JetBrains. Um, they are giving us a free license to PyCharm to give away. Would anybody like a free license to PyCharm? All right. Here you go. Congratulations, men. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Good, good thing you came back. <laughs> With that, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thanks for the, the conversation.